The first time I visited Area 51, I had all the answers I needed. I fully trusted the government's official position that it was nothing more than an Air Force facility. The only folks who thought that aliens existed were 9-11 truthers, basement dwellers, and the homeless who talked to trash cans. <laughs> I found it easy to dismiss challenging questions when my Irish Catholic upbringing provided me with clean answers. With unwavering religiosity and a healthy amount of generational trauma, my parents gave me all the answers to what happens when we die, what was good, and what was evil. There weren't a lot of what ifs around the dinner table, so by the time I was 28, trusting the official narrative from the authorities that, it, that provided it came pretty easy. I was habituated to follow orders. No wonder I ended up in the Army. Um, <laughs> my unit was preparing to deploy. And the southwestern United States, with its sprawling mesas, desert shrubs, and brutal ridgelines, felt close enough to Afghanistan. It's also incredibly cost-effective for the military to fly from base to base, bypassing civilian airports. And there's less questions from busybodies, too. I was there with other teammates to test out new cameras and lenses on day and night reconnaissance. My fellow soldiers and I spread out through the desert terrain. We all had the required secret clearance to be in the area. My only major restriction was that I was not allowed to photograph buildings or people in the area. I learned that I needed a top secret clearance equal to the president's to even look at the people who worked there. That was fine by me. I really wasn't interested in conversation anyway. The sun had barely crested the, the surrounding mountain ranges as I made my way into the desert shrubs. The dosimeter clipped to my vest read green. If the needle inched out of that green zone, I'd be in trouble. After all, they did test nukes there. As burrs collected on my combat boots with every step, I imagined, a, I pictured a mushroom cloud rising over the horizon. Somewhere unseen out in that mesa that stretched beyond the canyon, my fellow soldiers hauled cameras and gear of their own. I tried the radio and heard nothing but static. I was odd. I checked my GPS against my compass. They didn't match up. Curiouser and curiouser. I tried to pinpoint my location so my bosses could find me. If I were just using a map, I could understand making errors and not getting a solid location. But I had a GPS backup, and with both those systems, I had never been mistaken. Clearly, I should not have been left alone without adult supervision. <laughs> my map was correct, but my electronics were all wonky, showing me miles from where I knew I was. I chalked that up to latent radiation in the area and gave them my best guesstimate. Not a pinpoint, just a general location. The camera was no different. The menu settings wouldn't take the date or time. I tried adjusting, but nothing held. And as I looked around in that desert silence, I knew I was hundreds of miles from the nearest radio shack. <laughs> How many rads am I being exposed to? The dosimeter, my only true company, replied, you're worrying me, don't worry about it. I mean, I should worry a little, right? The government wouldn't send you to a place that would give you cancer just to test out cameras, now would they? <laughs> oh. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> the dosimeter proudly displayed its green reading. The fading light snapped me back to my work. I needed to get the night vision gear onto the camera before everything went pitch black. The setting sun cast shadows that crossed the desert canyon stretched up the side to the mesa, then disappeared into the inky black of night. The temperature dropped some 25 degrees. A crescent moon rose in the east. Crickets chirped. I pulled on a jacket and futzed with the camera, going through the same shots and drills I had done earlier in the day. I grew up in LA, so being in a career where I spent up to two weeks at a time living in, in the woods, out of my backpack was pretty surreal. I never really sought out nature, but once exposed, I became quite reverent and appreciative. The moon set around 2 a.m., and I had finished with my camera work. Without the moon, the stars shined especially bright. I took time to enjoy the constellations I knew best, Big Dipper, Cassiopeia. I marveled at the enormity of the Milky Way, just allowing myself a moment of awe. As I scanned the night sky, I spotted a small hexagon of stars that resembled no constellation I'd ever seen before. Then it moved. <laughs> <laughs> Airplanes move in a straight line with lights that blink on and off. Satellites move in a straight line with lights that stay constantly on. Meteorites 
flash momentarily while moving in a straight line in one direction only. But stars? Stars aren't supposed to move at all. The hexagon did not blink. The lights did not stay in a straight direction. The lights hovered and then shot across the sky. They came back, turned wildly in the air, and then hovered again. This midsummer night waltz stayed over Area 51 for what seemed like hours, but was really just a few brief moments. I was so mesmerized by the lights that I couldn't blink, and I never even thought to radio the other guys. As the lights arced and barreled through the night, my heart skipped beats. They briefly disappeared, playing celestial hide-and-seek, and my confusion turned to fascination. I stood there, transfixed. Then I remembered, I had a camera. <laughs> I struggled to keep my hands steady as I took pictures of the strange lights, and my blood thudded in my ears. Then they were gone, and I stood there, camera in hand. The next morning, I packed up and moved down the ridge. I had to hike across the canyon to a road to get picked up. I went through the events of the night as I trudged the warming canyon. Maybe I had imagined it. Maybe I was just sleep deprived. I wondered what the camera's memory card would show, the night sky or something more. But when I plugged in the memory card back at the office, the file folder was empty. Fuck me. <laughs> I felt my stomach drop and my doubt set in. Maybe I hadn't seen what I had seen. Maybe it was a weather balloon. Maybe I should start talking to trash cans. <laughs> but in light of my disappointing results, I resolved not to speak about what I saw. No one wanted to be the weird guy. Weird guys don't work in the military. At least they didn't at the time. At the time, going whole hog into conspiracy theories was the quickest way to get kicked out of the club. I had seen it before. There was always some dude who would stop conversations when he entered the room. It was like high school, but with tanks and body armor. Still though, I did see something I couldn't explain. But it would have to remain that way. I wasn't about to run off the only friends I had with tales of little green men in flying saucers. Flying hexagonal saucers. In the years after, the military sent me to underdeveloped and impoverished countries. I experienced war and natural disasters. I assisted refugees surviving trauma as they migrated to more stable environments. I saw folks in Afghanistan survive floods. I saw South Americans walk away from car accidents without a scratch on them. Once, I survived being lost for eight hours in a blizzard all by myself on a mountain at 14,000 feet. I knew all of these things were unexplainable, but I never believed them to be acts of God. I had seen people from many religions and no religion at all go through death and pain and trauma, and I had come to grips with the uncertainty of life. There was no divine plan, no grand design, the only dudes with all the answers were the ones selling snake oil, the weird dudes. <laughs> On another assignment later in my career, I returned to Area 51, this time with more security clearance, the presidential kind. I was able to speak to a few random folks, but they stayed tight-lipped. Their clipped sentences and blank expressions ensured no secrets would be spilled. I spent 10 days hiking the mountains. I was older a little more open-minded, but still under the employ of the US government, strictly on a need-to-know basis. I kept scanning the night sky in the hope of seeing what I saw the first time, and the only thing I got was a strained neck. But a few months ago, a buddy came to town and we had dinner and drinks. Three rum and cokes into dessert, he brought up that first Area 51 trip. I had never spoken about it, not even as a civilian. I couldn't even program the cameras right, I told him. They weren't the best, he laughed. The waiter brought us another round of drinks. My buddy plucked out the straw and placed it alongside the other three he'd already collected. Then he looked at me and asked in a low voice as if someone nearby might overhear. Do you remember the lights? <laughs> Thank you. Joe Hudak, everyone. <laughs>